So please, can you um, allow him to um, speak without in interruptions? Um, as I said, I have the right to just cancel the, the session if, if there's too much um, noise and interruption. Um, and I just wanted to state a couple of other things. So first of all, that we, we didn't know um, the story that was going to break over the last couple of days uh, when um, he accept, accepted the invitation to come and speak to us. Um, so we didn't know this story beforehand. Um, uh, in fact, he had sent me uh, the slides he was going to show in this session, and it did not include any of the, any of the work that he's now going to talk about. It was sort of preclinical data, but not, nothing uh, involving human, embryo, human embryos uh, that were implanted. Um, and I should also state that um, you know, we're in a venue, uh, we have very generous hosts, Hong Kong, Hong Kong University, University of Hong Kong, and our hosts have also, they have a, um, a strong tradition of allowing free speech. And so we are complying with that, uh, that tradition of, of free speech. So anyway, I would like to, um, if you can hear me, ask Zhang uh, uh, Kuei uh, to come to the stage and, and present his, uh, his, his work. I don't know where he is, so hence the... Uh... Okay, thank you. <clears throat> uh, first, I must apologize that these results leaked unexpectedly, taken away from the community of the full data being presented immediately in a scientific venue. And through a peer review process, engaged before this conference. So this study... It's very disturbing for everyone here if you're taking photographs. You stand in the field, you already take the photographs, you don't need to take any more. So it's quite free of it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You need more. Okay, so this study has been submitted to, to a scientific journal for review. I also thank the Associated Press, who we engaged the months before the chain's birth, out of a, a commitment to the accurate reporting the study's outcome from many points of view. I also thank my university, although they are unwell of the study's conduct. So, Winnie Herbert, I should also thank you for your statements now and the wisdom that shared with me, as well as the community for discussing this data and providing this forum. I'll give an overview of our data focused on human and monkeys. Despite wonderful progress in HIV therapy and access to this therapy, new infections remain three times higher than the UN AIDS 2020 target. So HIV remains a top 10 cause of death in several countries, in particular developing countries. For 
uninfected children born by an HIV positive mother who know, make up a large percentage of births in areas of southern Africa. The risk of being infected by HIV in the first few months of life is many, many times higher than other babies. This is a, a serious unmet need as an infection's severity is often made even worse by discrimination. So a copy of a natural protective ani against HIV infection is carried by as much as about 10% of the population in several European countries. This ani leads to the first functional cure of HIV and decades of clinical trials, making this natural small deletion in CCR5 gene one of most studied variations. And the CCR5 gene are one of the most understood gene. We first explored the impact of CCR5 gene lockout in mice to investigate the multi-generation effect. Editing was efficient as expected. We established a third generation CCR5 long mice, which we confirmed by Western blood and flow cytometry. Tissue pathology was normal in heart, liver, lung, and stomach. Two common behavior assessment showed no difference. We then assess whether this set should get RNA against the human CCR5 gene could be designed. So we assessed seven. I highlighted one that called at exactly the start of data 32 mutation. It has an MIT specificity score above threshold, predictive of having no arc target activity. A few previous publications has assessed the same or similar get RNA in multi cell type, including non variable embryos. SG4 induced the most efficient editing activity in a cell line and the 3 pn human embryos. Since this target site is conserved in the monkey genome, we could use the monkey as an animal model to assess the SGN further. We found Injecting the castling closer to fertilization promoted the most efficient editing efficiency, consistent with the Cas9 required 10 to find the target loss and its degradation over 10. The rate of fertile eggs forming process was not affected by exposure to Cas9, which we observed across experiments. So sequencing of the blood cell quadrant confirmed earlier castellan injection also reduced the mosaicism. To look more closely on the mosaicism, we also sequenced every individual cell in several embryos. Editing appeared to occur at the one, two, three cell stage. On the assumption that Cas9 degrades quickly and requires time to find the, the red target, we explored a strategy to reduce the mosaicism by de delivering a second injection of Cas9 to an embryo at the two cell stage. The development of eggs to the blood cells was not impaired.
We expand the sample size, which confirmed this previous observation. We still observe the variation across parents and the cycles. We then look to see if this protocol could translate to human embryos. We found, as others have reported, the Kessler protein was the most efficient delivery format. Lowering the dose compared to the monkey embryo also improved the efficacy. Upon the advice I received after presenting early results at the February 2017, the UC Berkeley Genome Editing Workshop, we edited non-viable embryos and established two embryonic stem cell, cell names. So both are bioanalytic lockout and the karyotypes are normal. Embryonic stem cell marker expression was normal by staining and the flow cytometry. This embryonic stem cell also found all three germ lines during the 14-day EV experiment, which is a marker of safety. Another serious safety concern is off-target. Embryo editing target a single or few cell stage of life. Any off-target would pose very serious consequence and extend potential through the whole body. In adult gene therapy, off-target are expected but a less healthy problem. We assessed off-target initially by single-cell whole genome sequencing of embryo prior to the implementation. We used the isothermal MDA amplification method to minimize the false positive, false negative rate and for unbiased coverage. The Milton Poff lab used the same approach, which take a step further by sequencing the parent genome to detect off-target risk sites that exist only for each parent and a particular embryo, but not in the reference genome. We created a pool of off-target risk sites by first collecting all any sites mentioned in previous publication. We add the genome sites for the unbiased assessment of a potential cleaved site. And, and in silico prediction, such as the MIT CRISPR design, uh, both the original and the 2018 updated version. Finally, we import the parent genome, which allow facing to improve sensitivity and uh, detect the larval risk sites unique to each embryo, which may emerge from inherited India or SMPs. So all this low site found a person as a pool on the order of 10,000 spots per embryo. We use whole genome sequencing to assess for this spot and validate any findings by single sequencing. I will review genome sequencing data with the data on the null and nana as focus and end. Of the potential cleavage sites identified by the genome-wide unbiased digenome assay None was observed in the whole genome sequencing data. And no activity was observed at the risk site identified uh, by the 2018 version of MIT technology, MIT CRISPR design software and the original version. 
we explore off target in the HESC cell name, Jared from Edit Embro. Although we didn't have access to Embro with the, the parental donor's genome, we identified one potential off target. This off target is in the intergenic region, although we cannot uh, confirm whether this is an uh, inheritance or it's due to editing. So here you can see the editing efficiency across 19 viable embryos from volunteers. So we performed PGD whole genome sequencing across the embryo and didn't uh, identify the off-target sites. So in one embryo, we identified a uh, six KB deletion at the on-target sites. It did not affect any gene but CCR5. The CCR5 genes distance from other genes protect against the, the risk of large deletion. We detect the large deletion by us assessing for the chimerical reads and the visual confirmation. Now I will focus on the Lulu and the Lala's genomic data. We sequenced the genome of both parents to confirm the target size conservation and to support off-target detection. The mother was HIV elective. The father, positive, with undetectable viral load. So the XC and the sperm washing was used to prevent transmission. At day five, so we have few cells were sampled from blood site for PGD. We follow on these results during the pregnancy by self-free DNA after the mother declined and amino synthesis. So Lulu and Nala were born normal and healthy with upcon score eight and nine. After birth, we sequenced several different tissues. So in this mark and Greece first AVF cycle, pre-implementation genetic diagnosis from the two blood sites were edited. One was a bionic fringe shift lockout, which should shorten the CCR5 protein, similar to the natural protective variation. Another has an in-free deletion in one and E. The deletion expects to destabilize local protein structure in the nearby HIV binding sites. The parents were informed of implementation of this in related to HIV infection and remind them the option to leave the trial without implementation or to choose the white type embryos. The couple elected to implement this embryo to start a two embryo pregnancy. In addition to the Sanger data, we also report to the volunteer whole genome sequencing data. The reads cover that more than 80% of the genome. The whole genome sequencing identified one off target in the MEG based re intergenic region, far from other genes, with no known coding RNA and transcription factor binding sites. The volunteers were informed of the risk of posed by the existent one potential off target, and they decided to implant. <clears throat> uh, 
after the mother declined aminosynthesis. Serial cell-free DNA of blood test didn't observe the intergenic off-target from PGD. So another cell-free DNA test found no larva cancer gene mutation. After birth, the deep sequencing of the cold blood, which is primarily the baby's blood, confirmed editing pattern observed during PGD and cell-free DNA. Sangha sequencing also confirmed this observation. After birth, both MySeq deep sequencing and Sangha sequencing did not detect intergenic off-target observed during the PGD. This suggests it was an artifact of a single cell amplification or a mosaic of target that happened to occur in the few 12 plus cells sampled for PGD. For whole genome sequencing, we did a 100x cold blood and 30x on the placental. No off target were observed genome wide. Neither were large deletion. We will continue to assess the effect of editing in the chains, including testing a blood sample for susceptibility to HIV infection at the P3 biosafety lab. We also further investigate the off-target effects and the mosaicisms across multiple tissues. And the plan to monitor the chain's healthy for the next 18 years with the hope that they will consent as adult for continued monitoring and support. Thank you. Okay, so what we're going to do is, is have a little panel discussion, just the three of us, to make sure that the, the details of the science are, are well understood before we open it up to some general questions. Okay. Um, so Matt is up here to help me with this. So Matt, do you want to start or shall I start? Okay. Um, the, you obviously you chose to work with CCR5 because you, you felt that this was um, a, a valid first uh, um, gene to, to target um, in this, with this approach. Um, but do we really know enough about CCR5 and its, its function? Because as you said, that there are naturally occurring mutations, there are many, probably millions of people who naturally have mutations in the CCR5 gene. They're mostly northern European, or that's the, thought to be the origin of it. It's very infrequent, at least the Delta 32 mutation is very infrequent in, in China, for example. So that could, be the, that, uh, that could reflect either that it never sp spread here from Northern Europe, or that it's selected against in China. Um, so it's known that it, ha having mutation in CCR5 protects against HIV infection but does it predispose to other complications? So West Nile virus, we know there's some evidence to suggest that increase that. And then, just a long question, I'm sorry, but I will answer that one first. What about other things? There's also a suggestion that maybe influenza, um, so patients with CCR5 mutations may be more susceptible to severe effects of influenza, which would be bad in this part of the world. Okay, so we choose the CCR5 
It's for multiple reasons. So first, it's a, it's it's a, uh, HIV. It's a lethal disease in several developing countries, and also this HIV exposed but uninfected children not became a new global challenge. And uh, they are studying in Zambia, also also studied in China, show that the those HEU children may get affected from six months to 18 months in this one year period with a possibility of uh, 0.5 to 2.5%. So that is significant uh, number uh, compared to the kids in general. And so for this gene, we have studied for decades and there's multiple clear trials on that. And uh, also, for the Western layer and the other uh, potential set effect of this, so during the inferred consent, it was written down to infer there will be Western layer virus, not infections. And also in your 18 years or even longer monitoring program, there's a Western layer virus uh, detection regularly. And, <coughs> do you want to follow up on that? Well, shall I? I, I want, want to follow up a bit more on that. So, um, so this is the CCR5 obviously must have a, a function in the immune system where it normally operates, yeah. which is not, nothing to do with HIV. The immune system we know has effects throughout the body and that in, includes the brain, right? It, it's known to affect aspects <coughs> of functioning of the, of the, the, of the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the, the uh, other aspects of a brain function. Um, you cited your own work on looking at uh, some evidence to suggest that there was no effect on, on behavior or, or cognition, but there has been another paper published a couple of years ago suggesting that actually mice with mutations in CCR5 have enhanced cognitive ability. So that poses an, an issue because have you inadvertently caused an enhancement at the same time as... Uh, as, as dealing with this. So, um, do you think we really know enough about CCR5 and, and its role in the immune system um, to choose that as a first gene? Uh, okay, so the first is uh, 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 I against uh, using the gene editing for the enhancement. Uh, second, so the study you mentioned, uh, uh, I saw the paper and uh, I believe we did more independent app verification. Uh, mm -hmm. And also for the uh, CCR5, uh, we start this. Uh, a reason is, uh, another reason is uh, we should start with some simple, well understood single gene as we get a conservative first model so that maybe in the future you can move on to multiple gene, more complicated genotypes. Okay, well, Matt. So thank you for your clear presentation. I think there's gonna be some questions about um, some of the numbers in the process. So for example, how many uh, couples have you consented? How many eggs have you obtained from each mother? How many embryos have you attempted to modify? How many then had the correct modification? And then how many were attempted to be implanted? And then how many actually gave way to birth? So what's the pipeline that you have done is part of this project. So there are in total eight couples enrolled for this study, and um, one dropped out. And for the remaining seven couples, uh, this excuse me, and they were all similar in father was HIV positive, mother was HIV negative. Yeah. So the enrollment criteria uh, criteria requires the, the father to be. HIV positive, and the mother to be HIV active, and plus some other age requirement. And other. So, uh, so for all the couples, uh, they after inferring consent for multiple rounds, um, uh, inferring consent with the scientists and uh, also with the team members, and uh, then under the normal IVF procedure. So, um, collect eggs, and then. <clears throat> we inject casein protein and get on a. And if, sorry, how many eggs total between the seven couples? 
So uh, in total, we have uh, uh, 31 FOLA sets. For that number, is the, yeah, it's 30, yeah, 30 embryo plus sets that are yeah. So 30, 31 were injected? Uh, it's, it's more, I mean, what I mean is 30 developed to plus at stage. And with that, about 70% of the embryo were edited. 70% had biallelic editing or 70% had monolelic? And what was the percent mosaicism in those 30 embryos when you, well, that's right, you wouldn't know because you only took one cell. Yeah. So, and then, uh, okay, so why did you decide on these two rather than the other 24? Uh, this, this couple happened to be first to be pregnant. Have you subsequently implanted the remaining in the six other couples? So it, uh, the clear trial was paused due to the current situation. I have one other thought. Um, can you, I'm from the United States, so I'm not completely familiar with um, how the review process. So how did you go through, who did you discuss this trial with in terms of your supervisors, mentors, um, other people, in terms of getting feedback on the trial design, the consent process? Who, tell me sort of the scope of the team that was involved in designing this clinical trial. So when I start this, uh, even from the pre study, uh, uh, I first talked to a couple of scientists and doctor to find out uh, CCR5 is the one to recommend. And uh, then uh, once I have uh, some early data on the preclinical, I presented uh, in the Cold Spring Harbor lab meeting in New York in 2017, and uh, also in the use the Berkeley Genome Editing Conference. So some of the audience also in that conference too. So I, I get feedbacks, uh, positive feedbacks and also criticisms and also some constructive advices. Uh, and I continue to talk to not just scientists but also the, the top ethicists in the United States at Stanford, like Winnie Herbert as mentioned, multiple time talk and uh, also, I show my particular data to many scientists uh, visiting. Uh, when I started a, a clinical trial for the, yeah, for the inferno consent, it's a, uh, we just, we take the NH guideline as a reference and uh, draft the inferno consent. And the later was reviewed by a US professor. Uh, and when the, it's a, a pregnant. Uh, this inferno cancer was reviewed again. So we had a subsequent uh, a supplementary material for the inferno consent to add the, the long-term follow-on plan. Uh, and when, yeah, and also. Let me, let me go to that. How many, how many people read the informed consent before you showed it to the family? How many people reviewed the informed consent and felt like it was appropriate? Uh, so outside of my team, there are about four people. And the, when this couple was in full consent, the, the, uh, it's, there's observer, uh, observer uh, from United States professor and also a Chinese professor in the Chinese academic science. And it was, it's oh. audio recorded. Yeah. So on, on the informed consent issue, uh, was that the gained by a, a, an independent person talking to the patients or were you or your team involved in that process directly? Mm. That's including the first one, this uh, uh, team member uh, went to talk to the volunteer first for two hours. Uh, and then after about one month, mm -hmm. the volunteers came to Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. And I personally, together with two another professor, uh, give up one hour and 10 minutes Inferring consent, but you were so you were directly involved. Uh, directly involved. Because the they were, because yeah. after one month they actually yeah. bring out the papers. See off target, 
CRISPR things is already in place on that. And one more question, maybe even upstream. Um, how did you recruit these couples into your study? Was it done by personal connections? Was did your institute put out a uh, release? So how was the recruitment done of these particular couples? It's uh, by uh, uh, HIV and AIDS uh, volunteer group. Okay. okay. Um, I think what we should do now is is uh, well start to open it up for questions from the floor, but uh, David Baltimore wants to say a quick word um, first, if possible. Yeah. Um, so then when I come to taking questions, I will take questions from the general participants um, who are lined up. Um, I will also um, take, have, I have questions uh, from the media, so I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, uh, many of them are the same, um, so I'm not necessarily going to say who asked the question because they're the same questions. Um, and, but actually also quite a few of them uh, have actually been answered uh, during Dr. Hay's talk, so I probably won't bother with those either, but I'll be quite selective. But first of all, David. I, I want to thank Dr. Hay for coming um, and for being responsive to the questions that have been asked. Uh, I still think that the statement that we made uh, at the end of the last meeting, which is that it would be irresponsible to proceed with any clinical use of germline editing unless and until the safety issues have been dealt with in this broad societal consensus, basically an open process, uh, that that has not happened and that it would still be considered irresponsible. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, it has been an, a transparent process. We've only found out about it um, after it's happened and after the children are born. Um, I personally don't think that it was medically necessary. Um, the choice of the diseases that we heard discussions about earlier today uh, are much more pressing than uh, providing to one person some protection against HIV infection. Um, I think there has been a, a failure of self-regulation by the scientific community um, because of a lack of transparency um, and uh, the, I'm speaking here entirely for myself. Uh, the committee that uh, organized this meeting will be meeting uh, and issuing a statement, but that will not be until um, tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, why, why don't we continue? Okay. All right. So yeah. let me take, so, uh, start off with maybe David Liu from. Hi, David Liu from uh, the Broad Institute, Harvard, and HHMI. Uh, first, I'd like to echo uh, uh, David Baltimore's comments, thanking you for coming here under some unusual circumstances. Um, I'll uh, limit myself to two questions. First, I just don't see the unmet medical need for these girls because the father is HIV positive, the mother is HIV negative, you already do sperm washing, and thus, you already could generate uninfected embryos that could give rise to uninfected babies. So could you first uh, describe what is the unmet medical need, not of HIV in general, which I think we all appreciate, but what is the unmet medical need for these patients in particular? And second, um, you justify the critical decision of implanting these embryos to generate a human pregnancy with the decision made by the patients as opposed to made by the scientists and the doctors and the ethicists, can you also comment on uh, what is our responsibility as scientists and doctors and uh, independent communities to make that decision for the patients rather than allowing patients to make critical decisions uh, like that uh, uh, seemingly on their own? Thank you very much. Okay, so the first uh, guess whether CCR5 is a uh, medical need. 
So, <clears throat> okay, uh, I truly believe that uh, it's, this is not only just for this case, but for, for millions of uh, this HEU children. They need this uh, protection since the HIV vaccine is not available. And uh, I have personally experienced with uh, some people in the some AIDS village where 30% of village were, uh, people were infected. They have even have to give their children to their relatives or uncles to raise just to prevent potential transmission. And also for this specific case, I feel it's a, I feel proud actually. I feel proudest because uh, the mark thought it's, he lost the hope for the life. But when the baby was born and with his protection, he sent a message at the day of birth, say, I will work hard, earn money, and take care of his two daughters and his wife for his second half life. So. Let me, can I ask, before we get to Dave, the second question, um, you said that um, there's been no other implantations, but just to be clear, are there any current pregnancies with embryos that have been genome edited as part of your clinical trials? There is a, another one, but it did tend to monitor. There's what? There's another potential okay. pregnancy. It's very, it's very, I think it's a, you said a very early stage, so. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, a chemical stage. pregnancy rather than. Yes. But in the interest of the transparency. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, well, let's, sorry, let's we do this side first, and then I'm going to ask a question from the media. So go ahead. My name is Evan Kirksey from Deakin University in Australia, and I, I have a two part ethical question. So, first, I was wondering if you could just slow down a little bit and talk about the institutional ethics process that you say that you went through. Um, so, looking to the past. The, the second part of my question is really about the future and, and how you understand your responsibility to these children. So your last slide indicated that you're going to be doing some follow-up treatment. So just an invitation to slow down a little bit and, and talk about your responsibility towards the future as well. Okay, so let's just uh, ask it, not you but people here a question. So do you see your friends, your relatives, who may have a cerebral from genetic disease. So, uh, for what I, I see, it, those people, they need help. We should, for millions of families with uh, this disease, inherited disease, or be exposed to infectious disease, we should show passion, compassion to them. And if we have this technology, we can make it available earlier. That would be help the much more people for this field indeed. So when talking about the future, uh, what I mean is first that it needs to be, first it's a transparent, open, and uh, share what I, the knowledge I accumulated and uh, to the society, to the world. And then let the society decide what we should to do in that step. If I might, my question was actually much more specific about the actual children, not an abstract question about the future, but going forward with, with these children that have been born, yeah. it, how do you understand your responsibility to them? I mean, it relates to actually a question from the, questions from the media, a set of them, which is basically, you know, thing, questions like, you know, will you publish the identity of Lulu and Nana in the future? Um, to how are you going to prove the effect effectiveness of the treatment if the, if the two individuals uh, remain in secret? Um, but of course you have this conflict between you really have to protect patient identity in this case, um, but the world wants to know, will want to know whether they are healthy, whether the method has, uh, has any negative consequences or positive consequences. So how are you going to deal with that? Uh, so First, it's against the Chinese law to disclose the identity of the HIV positive people in public. Uh, okay. uh, second, so uh, 
for this specific couple, it's on the careful monitoring the health, and uh, I think I would propose that uh, it's the data or, or the information should be open to necessary regulatory and uh, all necessary to a maybe a civil panel of experts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, let's get a question over the side. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Zhang Tianzhe. Beside my work, I also as a founding member of Inter International uh, Law and Technology Interoperability Association. We discover about uh, law and technology and the future of legal profession. There are a lot of questions has been collected from our members, but I only ask a few uh, globally. Uh, one, uh, the first one, one question, please. Choose a good one. Okay. Okay, um, the good one, I think everyone is great. So uh, the, uh, the most important one is like, um, we are curious, how, would you, how did you convince the, the parents when you, um, when you, uh, when you uh, started this experiment? Did you tell them like there's alternative solutions, for example, other ways of to um, avoid of, um, of AIDS infection from, of their child? Uh, and se second, uh, it's about how did you done the ethics review? How many institutions has been involved and how was the process? Thank you very much. Okay, so the first question, uh, how we convinced the, the patient, uh, this volunteers, they all have good education background. So they know pretty much uh, a lot of information about the HIV the drug, all this alternative approach to them, or even the latest uh, research articles published. This is common, as all the HIV infected people, they are usually in a social network together. Well, the latest uh, advance in HIV prevention treatment information is available. Uh, so when the, the volunteer come to the informed consent, they already understand uh, quite well about uh, the genetic technology and its side effect or potential benefit. So it's, uh, I think it's a, uh, it's a mutual exchange of information that made the, uh, like the volunteer made the decision. Can I ask a, a question again that goes back to transparency? Yeah. Is would you be willing to post the informed consent, obviously the generic informed consent, and your manuscript in preparation in a public forum so it can be reviewed, um, such as on BioArchive or on a publicly available website for the informed consent so the community can um, read in detail about what you've done? Would you consider doing that? Yes, actually, the informed consent is already on the NAP site, NAP website. You can just search my name, you will find it. I have an English version there, so you can read it. Mm -hmm. the second, for the manuscript, uh, even I, when I draft the manuscript, there are already about uh, 10 people out of the map. A few in the United States have me to edit the manuscript. When it's ready to submit, I also send out for uh, several to give comments. So I uh, originally want to uh, submit to BioArchive, it's the second my plan, uh, but uh, some advices from some people that I should go peer review first before it's posted on our archive. Yeah. So I took that advice. I, I think you took that advice, but would you change your mind now? Because I think the circumstances have changed. And I think, you know, as you can see, there's a big demand to know exactly what you did. You don't have to answer that now, but just yeah. to say, okay. yeah, yeah. you should think about that. Yeah. Um, let's take a, a question here first, and then I'll do another one from the media. Hi, I'm Anna Middleton, and I'm Head of Society and Ethics Research at the Wellcome Genome Campus in Cambridge. I'm also a genetic counsellor, and I'm very interested in the informed consent process. So if I'm understanding you right, there's a, there's a consent form that you're happy to share now. It was reviewed by four people, and there was a conversation that lasted about 10 minutes with the patients. Um, given that we know, particularly in the UK, that the average reading age of the general public is around age 10, and that the vast majority of the public don't understand what the word genome is. I'm quite interested in what happened in that conversation and how you explained what the risks were and what evidence you have that they actually understood. Okay, so yeah, I can describe that. 
first, uh, I believe uh, Kyo corrected your thing 10 minutes, and it's correct, it's one hour and 10 minutes one for this couple. Minutes. Okay. Uh, so what happens, it's in a conference room with uh, these couples, me and two observers. And uh, the print copies was given to the couple before uh, the print consent. Do you know that they could read them? Did you know that they could read them and understand them? I think I that. Did, did you know that they could read okay and understand what you were saying? Yeah, they are very educated. Yeah. Okay. And uh, yes, so and then, uh, so each of take this uh, inferring consent. I explain from page one to page 20, line by line, paragraph by paragraph, and, uh, and they have the right to ask any questions during this inferring consent. They get, and uh, uh, so they, yeah, once they we go through the entire uh, inferring consent at the end, uh, I leave them uh, to private discussion. So you have uh, freedom and time to discuss uh, the couples, uh, and also they have the choice to decide uh, today, or you could take it home and decide uh, later.